Alrighty, let's talk about limits in 14.2, and I'm going to break this up into three sections. I think I think three sections. The first video, uh, we're just going to talk about finding uh, a limit or if it does not exist. Um, so we write D and E. So the first one, we just show ways that you can do this. So that'll be this video. The second video, we're going to talk about the sandwich or the squeeze theorem, um, which almost shows up on almost always shows up on exam. Actually. I don't know why P professors have been wanting to avoid this um, recently, but Sandra or squeeze theorem to find a limit. And then the third part, we're gonna talk about continuity. And uh, that's gonna be this three part video on limits. Uh, there's this one thing in the book, it's like epsilon delta. I really hope that's not in the uh, core problems. I don't wanna cover it. Uh, some professors last semester decided to cover it for some reason. And it was a mess. It was a mess. So, all right, let's begin then. And let's talk about how we find uh, if limits exist or not. So let's take a look at this following example, which comes from my notes and also a midterm uh, from 2016. And so you want to find if the limit of x comma y approaches 0, 0 of x to the 50 plus x to the 50, y to the 50 divided by the root of x to the 100 plus y to the 100. All right, when I see, we want to see if this exists or not. All right, um, so we want to find this limit. So the easiest way then to check to see if limits do not exist, all right, I, I, uh, I phrase that in a certain way. Um, but so to check to see if this limit does not exist, we can test if x equals 0 and only approach on the y line, right? So if I let x equal zero, then I have uh, zero to the 50 plus zero to 50, y to the 50, divided by root zero plus uh, y to the 100, which is equal to, well, the numerator is zero and the bottom new denominator is root y to the 100, but that's just gonna be zero, okay? So the limit then as y approaches zero, when we let x fix to be zero, is zero. But if we let y equal zero and then take the limit as x approaches zero, right? What do I get? Well, I get x to the 50 plus, well, x to the 50 times zero divided by the square root of x to the 100 uh, plus y to zero to the 100, right? Which is zero. And so then I get x to the 50 over the square root of x to the 100. And the limit as x approaches zero of this guy is really just x to the 50 over x to the 50, right? Because that's the square root of x to the 100, which is one. So, all right, then let's put the limit as x equals zero. So we see that if we let fix x equals zero and we fix y equals zero, we get different limits, right? So uh, these guys then, let me go full screen. Uh, these guys are not equal to each other. And so therefore the limit does not exist, okay? So that's one way to see if a limit does not exist or not, is to fix x equals zero, um, and then see what happens when you take the limit as y equals zero, and then fix y equals zero, and see what happens when you take the limit as x goes to zero. Um, but this is a very rudimentary way uh, to check it. So now let's take a look at another example then. Let's take a look at, uh, let's say the limit as x, y approaches zero, zero of uh, x, y over x squared plus y squared. All right, and this is, and you'll notice that almost these, these guys almost always approach zero, zero. It's usually how professors do it. Um, yeah, so just, just, just hold on there. It's, it's most of your problems are gonna be approaching zero, zero. Okay, so how can we do this problem? Well, you can, okay, we can do what we did above. So we let X equal zero, right? And then we see that, oh, that's equal to zero Y over zero plus Y squared, where the limit as Y approaches zero, which is then, zero over y squared, which is equal to zero, and then y equals zero, and then the limit as x approaches zero of zero uh, x, or x times zero, let's write it that way, right? Over x squared plus zero squared, and that's just then, oh, it's x times zero is zero, so the numerator is zero, and then so I'll just get zero over x squared, and the limit as this uh, and limit of this guy as x approaches zero, but that's just zero. So these guys are equal to each other, and we say that the limit is zero. Except that's wrong. This is wrong. 
No, the limit's not zero. Um, you can't do that. So the limit's not zero. Uh, just because you guys are equal to each other, this doesn't tell us anything about existence. Okay? The only thing it tells us is that it doesn't not exist. All right? So uh, it doesn't not exist for now along these lines. So, yeah, so just because these two are equal to each other, it doesn't tell any, anything about existence. The only thing that this test can tell us is if the limit does not exist. Otherwise, it doesn't say anything. So I've repeated myself like four times now. Hopefully, I've gotten that ingrained in your mind. So what do we do from here? Well, we can then let y is equal to mx, all right? which means now we can think about it as approaching along every line through the origin, right? Because we're letting m be any number. So now y is just any straight line through the origin, not just zero. And okay, so what do we get here? So now this is the limit as x approaches zero of, okay, this becomes x times mx over x squared plus mx squared which is equal to mx squared over x squared plus m squared x squared, which is mx squared over x squared times 1 plus m squared, right? Factor out the x squared, and then cancel the x's. You get m over 1 plus m squared. This is bad, right? Because this is the limit as x approaches 0 of m over 1 plus m squared. However, m is not x, right? So this is our limit. And guess what? It changes, right? It changes with whatever line we choose for y, okay? So uh, if I let y have a slope of 6, then this guy is going to, the limit is going to be 6 over 37, right? If y has a slope of negative 3, this limit is going to be negative 3 over 10, right? So, okay, so this limit does not exist, all right? And now this brings up the frustrating point of when in the hell do I know I am done with checking limits, okay? And the answer is you don't. Um, there's only one definitive way to show that a limit does exist, and that's by using the squeeze or the sandwich theorem, um, which is talked about in the next video. The methods we have now, you can never definitively show that a limit uh, exists. Um, yeah, like almost never. Uh, except the squeeze in the sandwich theorem. So it, it's frustrating, right? Because because the idea then is, oh, I have to check y equals, let's say, kx squared, and then y equal to kx cubed, and on to infinity, right? I have to check every single one of them. And professors usually aren't going to make you guys check that much. Maybe to kx squared, even then, that's a little rough. Um, and there's a certain example involving kx squared that I cover in recitation all the time. But... Uh, yeah, so generally speaking, you can check x equals 0, y equals 0, and y equals mx, and if those all equal the same thing, then generally then try to find a different way to show that the limit does exist. So again, these checking lines only show that the limit does not exist, and if nothing happens, then you can't say for sure that the limit does exist, okay? So... Um, Lastly, I want to cover one last way then to check if a limit exists or show that a limit exists. Um, let's let's take a look at x squared uh, x cubed plus y cubed over x squared plus y squared. All right, and again, this is the limit as x y goes to zero zero. And I wrote this too far too far on the edge of my screen. That's fine. All right. One way we can do this is we can substitute this in the polar coordinates by letting x equal r cosine theta and y equal r sine theta, okay? And what happens is that then I get r cosine theta cubed plus r sine theta cubed divided by um, r cosine theta squared plus r sine theta squared, all right? But what does this limit become? Well, if you think about it, polar coordinates, right, instead of being x, y grids like this, right, this is the Cartesian grid. In polar, we have grids that look like radii, right, and angles. Okay, so, 
So that's what the polar coordinate grid looks like, right? And therefore, when we're going to the point zero, zero, well, we're essentially approaching the point where r, right, the radius is going to zero, right? So these radii are getting closer to zero. So as x and y go to zero, zero, the radius is going to zero. And then theta, which is the angle here, right, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what theta is because as long as r goes to zero, then we're going to hit the origin, right? It doesn't matter where we are in theta. It doesn't matter if we're going out from this direction and coming in, right? Because if r is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, we're just going to go to the origin. So that means then that this becomes the limit as r approaches zero, okay, of this. And what is that? Well, this is r cubed, and then the top becomes cosine cubed theta plus sine cubed theta, right? Uh, so r cubed times the quantity of cosine cubed theta plus sine cubed theta. And then on the denominator, I get r squared times the quantity of cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. But wait, we know what this is. We know what cosine squared plus sine squared is. That's just one. So now I get r cubed uh, cosine cubed theta plus sine cubed theta divided by just r squared times one, right? So just r squared. And now I can cancel out r squared with the top. And now I got the limit as r approaches zero of r times cosine cubed theta plus sine cubed theta. Well, that doesn't matter. I don't care what this guy is in here because r going to zero will send this entire thing to zero, okay? And so that's gonna give me my answer, um, r is equal to zero. And if you check up here with polar coordinates, you're gonna see that um, you're gonna get r squared uh, cosine theta sine theta over r squared, which is equal to cosine theta sine theta, but now there's no r to kill these guys, right? So the limit as r approaches zero of something that depends on theta is gonna not exist, right? Because theta can vary, right? We're not having any restrictions on theta, we only have the restriction that r goes to zero, and therefore, right, uh, the limit as r goes to zero of cosine theta sine theta, well, if theta is one, then, uh, or if the theta is pi, then that value is going to be zero. But if theta is like pi over four, that value is going to be one half. And so it's not going to exist. So polar coordinates is one way that you can show that limits do exist. But even then, it fails occasionally. And very rarely do professors give an example where polar coordinates will also fail. But I have seen it happen. And again, I'm not going to cover that in this video. I'll cover it in my recitations. Um, it's also in my notes. Definitely think this one special example is in my notes as well. Okay, so great. That's limits. Uh, that's, that's how we show limits. Uh, you test lines, and if lines are inconclusive, then you usually use polar. Oh, last thing I forgot to, talk, forgot to talk about. Why the hell did I decide to use polar here? Why do I know to use polar? Or when should I use polar? Um, whenever you see like x squared plus y squared, always use polar. Why? Because x squared plus y squared if you notice, it just ends up being r squared on the denominator, right? x squared plus y squared always ends up equaling r squared on the denominator. That's something very important that you should keep in mind, and it happens over and over and over again. And in general, um, polar is not a bad idea to convert into when you're testing for limits because it 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 collapses this two variable limit right into one variable right because notice here's x y approaches zero zero and now we just simply have r approaches zero and when we have r approaches zero you can actually use like l'hopital and stuff like that which makes it even more flexible than the two-dimensional limit notice you cannot use l'hopital on this two-dimensional limit up here it doesn't work like that so uh yeah so polar good um use it a lot use it often and we're gonna move on to the next problem then, um, which we're gonna talk about the squeeze theorem. Zoom out so you guys can see, and I'm gonna post these notes online as well with the videos um, on my website, so.